It is. Welcome to episode two of Talking Prisoner Presents. We have another amazing guest with us today. She is best known for her recurring role in Neighbours, but also did appear in two episodes of Prisoner as two separate characters, as well as being an actress. She's also been a presenter and a voiceover artist. She's appeared in Winners, Noel's House Party, Body Melt, The Koala Brothers and Doctors, we are, of course, talking about Lucinda Cowden, who plays Melanie Pearson in Neighbours. Welcome to Talking Prisoner Presents. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me, Matt. Oh, it's an honour to have you here. Absolute <laughs> honour. <laughs> now, before we get into uh, Neighbours and Prisoner, um, we'd just like to learn a little about your life growing up, if that's okay. Of course. Yes. <laughs> Now, um, what, what can I tell you? Where'd you grow up? <laughs> well, um, Bayside, Melbourne, pretty much. Um, I was born in Ballarat, um, where my dad uh, had a job working for the railways. He was a civil engineer. And um, so he, we had like a railway house that we lived in. Um, and that was only, I was probably only four, three or four when we left Ballarat. Um, so I don't really have a whole lot of re recollection of it, except that it was very cold. <laughs> um, and I remember the lake at Wendoree that um, froze over. That's how cold it was. You know, wow. right? So, um, so yes, then we moved to Sunny Mentone um, in Bayside, Melbourne, where I grew up. Yeah, which was, you know, um, I hated it because I think you just do, don't you? You just <laughs> hate where you grow up. You just think it's the daggiest place in the world and... You know, why did mum and dad choose to live here, you know? Um, so we, yeah, so I had a kind of a pretty sort of, um, I don't know, my parents were kind of slightly boho, slightly left wing, I suppose. Um, and, yeah, we had a pretty interesting childhood. We went overseas um, young. My dad's British. So uh, we went over to the UK probably when I was about uh, seven. Okay. And we had a year touring around in a combi van. Wow. Which was probably the best education I got um, from the whole, you know, from school. You know, it wasn't school. I did do some um, correspondence while we were there. But, you know, it was just a fantastic education driving around in a combi van, driving around Europe at that age. It was just, and it was uh, the 70s. Oh. So, you know, it was pretty loose. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, yeah, that was great fun. So, um, yeah, mum and dad uh, broke up by the time I was about 15, I think. Um, and, um, yeah, and I moved out of home as quickly as I possibly could. So... <laughs> What an ungrateful child I was. <laughs> <laughs> and Mentone is a very beautiful area, I must say. Yeah. It is now, but it was, so, I just thought it was so daggy um, then. I know it's really, I actually, when I came back from the UK, um, I actually lived in Hampton for a while, which wow. I totally loved. And it's right around the corner. And I'm like, why did I, why did I hate it here so much? It just seemed like it was such a long way way away from town and I suppose as a young person I was going to drama school uh at, on Saturdays I went to St Martin's Theatre Company in South Yarra and um and I just wanted to all the people that I thought were really cool and stuff they all lived you know in Richmond and South Yarra and Paran and you know East Bentley even sounded exciting because <laughs> they were all so much closer to town than um, than Mentone was. But Mentone had a lovely beach, um, which was good for, you know, dramatic teenage, you know, behaviour. <laughs> <laughs> you, you did spend some time at school. And, and so did you have favourite subjects or su subjects you hated? Yes, yes, I was terrible at maths, like <laughs> terrible at all maths and all science. In fact, I got in year 10, which was the year that I was expelled. <laughs> I know, I know, crazy. Let me, let me, let me fill you in. <laughs> um, uh, so, oh, yeah, when I was 14, I got 13% for maths in, in year nine, I think it was, year nine. I got 14% for maths. Um, <laughs> we had a really horrible teacher 
um, which I think is often, you know, the way those things work. Um, but yeah, I, I was shocker. I was really, I was naughty. Um, my mum and dad were having sort of marriage problems. So they ended up going to mm. India um, to try to work things out. Oh, <laughs> India. And to try to work through all the terrible things they'd done to each other. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I just went a bit haywire when they left. We were left in the hands of my older sister and brother who weren't particularly responsible, let's just say that. And things got slightly out of hand at our house <laughs> um, to the point where I was having a whole lot of people. Everyone would come over to my house after lunch and no one would go back to school. <laughs> <laughs> and so a teacher came round one day. They'd followed us uh, and um, no parents. Um, there was, there was um, illicit behaviour going on there. Um, and um, boys from St. Bede's. Oh, St. Bede's, yeah. Because <laughs> I went to Mentone Girls High. So, yeah. Um, and there were boys from St. Bede's there. And their parents <laughs> didn't know. And other people's parents didn't know. So I got expelled because it was my oh. house. And I was told that I was the bad apple in the barrel. <laughs> Little me. Anyway, because it was my house, I suppose. So, which was actually the best thing that had ever happened to me because it meant that I went to a different school completely. I went to um, a school in Donvale, which you probably couldn't get further away from <laughs> Mentone, <laughs> um, which was called ERA, which was an old free school, an alternative school. Oh. And it had no rules. <laughs> it was fantastic. <laughs> And um, and I really um, seemed to find myself there, I think. And I put on plays and I, um, mm. I put on a huge school musical that I directed and starred in at 15 or 16 of Jesus Christ Superstar. Oh, really? um, that, that will go down in the annals of history for that school. It was, it was like the biggest thing. The biggest thing that had ever happened. And, um, yeah, and I loved it. And I, I stopped being the naughty girl because there wasn't anything to really rebel against, I suppose, um, because you were allowed to, you know, smoke cigarettes and, you know, not go to class because, you know, you wanted to continue doing your artwork. Um, <laughs> all that sort of stuff, which was absolutely brilliant. And I loved it there. I was only there for two years. But um, I loved it. And it sort of helped me, I think, find um, myself, I suppose, which yeah. is, I suppose, what you're doing at school. But I, I found it, I didn't fit in very well at Mentone Girls High because I wasn't like a surfy girl kind of thing. No. Um, I didn't go brown. I didn't have, like, the assets. <laughs> <laughs> And, yeah, I was sort of skinny and boyish and, you know, I, and I liked the sort of alternative music and stuff. So I wasn't really a Aussie crawl kind of girl. I kind of liked um, the sort of more, I was very into the Cure and the specials and, and British music, which I thought was super cool. So I was kind of figured I was a bit of a mod. I went and saw Quadrophenia too many times. Um, and um, yeah, so that was kind of um, what I was like as a youngster, I suppose. Wow. That's awesome. And did you did you have to cool. do maths at the new school? Or? Hey? Did you have to do maths at the new school or that was? Uh... I did do some maths. Yeah. Um, and I think I, I like, I think I definitely passed, but oh, only just. Yeah. <laughs> but I think they were a little bit behind their maths than Mentone Girls High were. So I think I was doing things that I'd already done. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I passed. <laughs> That's amazing. What was one of your uh, first jobs out of school? What did you do when you left school? Um, my had a, I had a, I've got a cousin who uh, ran a shop ran two shops. Um, one was in the, uh, the um, what's it called? The Block Arcade in Melbourne, which yep. is super posh. Um, and it was a glass shop called Glass Gallery. And I used to work there. And 
oh, look, I was just in fear of breaking things all the time. I just was so, it was such a panicked job for me. I my, Part of my job was to clean, there were like loads of these little glass mirrored cabinets that the glass pieces were all in. And my job was to take everything out and to clean the mirrors and to clean everything and put it back in. I, I was just... <laughs> It was just the most nerve wracking job. It was perfect to set me up for doing sort of, you know, live television presenting at a later date. Um, <laughs> but it was, it was incredibly nerve wracking uh, and I wasn't very good at it and I did break a few things. Um, so they sent me to the other shop. <laughs> the other shop was called basically British and had more sort of um, comedy sort of things, sort of those frozen moments and, and, and sort of knickknacks and stuff. And I was a bit better in there. That was a bit more quirky and sort of suited me a bit better. Um, so they were my first jobs. Um, I also worked in retail a little bit. Um, do, worked in a jean shop in Chapel Street. Um, and then I got another job. This is a funny story because I had a job that I shared with Fiona Cork. Oh, now, Fiona, those that played, don't know Fiona Cork, Gail Fiona Cork Robinson. played Gail Robinson in Neighbours. Paul's um, Paul's wife early on. One of Paul's wives. One of Paul's many. <laughs> like there's a harem of women of actresses around the place that have all been Paul's wife. Um, <laughs> she was, I think, the second of Paul's wives. Yes. Yes. Well done. Um, so yeah. So Fiona and I were both actresses, um, and we shared. Oh, the light's gone out. <laughs> Don't stress. I'll do that happen. What I'll do is I'll take, take it off for a little while and then we'll see if we can work it again. Yeah, okay. I'll go more near here. Is that better? Yeah, that's great. <laughs> um, so Fiona and I were both working as actors and um, we looked quite different. So we wouldn't very often go for the same roles, um, which was fortunate. So we could cover each other when we had auditions. Um, and so then Fiona went and got a job on Neighbours. How dare she? How very rude. Leave me there in the shop by myself. <laughs> um, and um, and then, funnily enough, about a year later, You're hi, there. Fiona. <laughs> <laughs> um, I turn up at Neighbours. So, yeah, so, yeah, I did a little bit of stuff like that, which um, sort of, you know, paid the rent. Amazing. What was Fiona yeah. like? Oh, she's adorable. Absolutely yeah. fantastic. We're still friends. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. She's a great girl. Really fantastic. She lives, um, well, I live outside of Melbourne as well, but she lives outside North okay. Way. She's, yeah, yeah, yeah. And with Nick Carafa, of course, who was also in Neighbours. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and probably in Prisoner. I, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know whether Nick was in Prisoner, but he probably was. <laughs> um, he was in Power and the Passion. He was my boyfriend in the Power and the Passion, oh, which yeah. was rather hilarious um, because um, Fiona was in <laughs> Neighbours at the time doing, yeah, so it was, yeah, all hilarious. Um, and, you know, Melbourne, six degrees of separation, really easy to do. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so, yeah, that was my, that was my early work life before um, work really, acting really kicked into gear. So, um so yeah, yeah. Now you've you've already told us that your parents decided to go to India to um to to get it all back together again, but yeah. obviously that didn't work. So um, <laughs> we'll, we'll move on. To the different next. idea in the first place, hey? Let's just leave the children to their to their own devices and go to India and do yoga. <laughs> anyway, it was the seventies. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I remember the seventies quite well. Uh, so over, to, over to you, Matt. Now, I'm assuming when you're at your last school was when you worked out you wanted to be an actress. Is that right? No, I knew I wanted to be an actress when I was about four. Oh, four. Okay. <laughs> yeah, my dad was in. Um, my dad was a singer. He had a beautiful baritone voice, yeah. and um, he was in the Melbourne Philharmonic Choir, and he was also in. Um, Cheltenham Light Opera Company, okay. Clock, as it was known back in the day. And um, it was sort of, they did amateur shows and stuff like that at a Monash University Theatre, um, which I can't remember the name of right at this second. Um, 
anyway um yeah so uh at four i was told that they needed some kids to be in carousel and um i was one of those i was designated one of those kids um i had to go and do a little uh see me thing and and they had a look at me and they said yes she'll do that's dennis's daughter she'll do that's fine dennis can look after her that was the way you got cast in those sort of things anyone got a daughter that we can stick in <laughs> so um so yeah so um a funny thing happened of course i ended up upstaging everybody by um something going wrong i think with i can't remember it was, i was supposed to have an ice cream and it was like a prop ice cream and the top kept falling off and i kept picking it up and putting it back on again and uh, and it was apparently hilarious and of course i got every and everybody was laughing at this stupid little kid trying to <laughs> fix her ice cream and and not watching the marvelous production that they should be watching anyway so I got a taste for it. I was like, oh, this is good. Oh, look, they're all looking. I'm going to do it again. Ah! <laughs> so, yeah, so I got a taste for people laughing at me very early on. That was and it. so, which, of course, made me do stupid things <laughs> on my life because I liked people laughing at me. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so I kind of, I think I knew that moment that I, that that happened, that that's what yep. I wanted to do. Wow. It's like, I've got the power. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, loved it. So, um, so yeah, so that was when I decided I wanted to be an actor. And, you know, all mum and dad did was try to tell me to do other things. You know, yeah. they were, they were absolutely and utterly like, you really need to do other things. You really need to go to university. You really need to, you know, um, and you know, it is a, now looking back it is a difficult it's it's a hard life to be an actor um yeah. and it's got a lot of pain and um in in stuff that makes it makes it difficult yeah definitely and they probably had a point in <laughs> hindsight <laughs> yeah. um but no i am pleased that i have uh that I have done this career because it has given me, you know, amazing um, opportunities to live in other countries and to travel and to do all sorts of amazing things. So it's it not often worked. as glamorous as it seems, though, is it? Oh God, no! It's never <laughs> as glamorous as it seems. <laughs> never, never. It's always, you know, you know. I mean, you just even now at Neighbours, when you think of how long it's been going, and you know how you would imagine the performance there that have been there for 28 years or you know 25 years or whatever uh, you know it's 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 they're not treated in a manner that you would you know think would be glamorous yeah yeah it's still hard it's, not, it's just not glamorous you're just part of a team as you know can the cameraman's just as important as that as the actor and the, you know in fact often more important um, so you know it's it, you never um I, I think in the UK people treated you a bit more differently, but here in Australia, actors are just part of the crew pretty much, and it's not particularly, it's not particularly glamorous, but it's really good fun. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're looking for fun, go there. If you're looking for glamour, I don't know, maybe maybe fashion or something's probably a better option. <laughs> <laughs> uh, your spare time. If you have any, do you are there things that you like to do? Um, I, I hate to use the word hobbies, but things that you enjoy in your spare time. Oh yeah, well I live on the Mornington Peninsula, which okay. is beautiful. Beautiful area. Um, so I live about five minutes walk from the beach, and as I said earlier, can I have a dog? So um, I am a partner and a stepdaughter. So uh, we love, you know, hanging out at the beach with a dog. Yeah. That's what we do a lot of, a lot of walking. Um, my partner is in bushland regeneration. Um, so he has, um, you know, a great understanding of this area and the beautiful places um, that there are. And so we go on lots of long walks and do that sort of stuff. So. I'm pretty staid these days. That's about um, as, as exciting as I guess. That's a beautiful area, Mornington. I'm not far from there, and it's we were just there a few weeks ago. It's it's stunning. It's really it is nice. totally stunning. You've got um, 
uh, Arthur seat just behind us mm. um, and and the beach just in front of us. So it's just gorgeous. I just love it. Yeah. And I lived, when I was in the UK, I lived in Brighton. So it was a similar sort of thing with the sort of mountains behind you and, yeah, and the beach in front of you, which is really nice. Because I would stop mountains, but it's the Devil's Dyke in Brighton, which is sort of, you know, high area, <laughs> high mountain. Mm. But, yeah, it's um it's still got that lovely feel, which I think I really need. And I suppose being brought up by the beach down in Mentone, yeah. um, I didn't realise how much I really love it. Yeah. Even though I'm probably not the kind of surfy girl or never have been, yeah. I still just love the beauty and and the calm that the looking out over the sea and looking out over the bay brings me. And and even when I was in the UK, looking out over the channel, um, yeah. everything seems dealable with because everything seems really little comparatively to that. So when I think of my problems and you know something that's annoying me or frustrating me or something, and I look out at the sea, I just I'm just like yeah, whatever. Yeah. Big W to those problems, girlfriend. <laughs> Look at that. So yeah, yeah, yeah no, you know, I no. love being down here, and um, and yeah, and other things that I like doing, I like to go and see as much sort of you know art as I can, and theatre as I can, and um, music as I can. Obviously, haven't been able to do much of that over the last two years. Um, but and I also, you know. And same as everybody, and like a bit of a binge watch on on the old um, on the old streaming service, whichever that may be. <laughs> so, speaking of the last two years, I, I don't want to go all negative uh, at, at at all. But how was the pandemic for you, and, and working on neighbours, and, and was it quite challenging the last two years? Well, what was challenging was before I got the job on neighbours because I had a, a little business myself where I was. Um, doing incursions in kinders and schools, doing drama and music with kids. Oh, really? Which I loved. I really loved it. And it was a really healthy little business, which um, was, you know, I was really enjoying as, and being able to still do plays and, you know, ads and voiceovers and still at the same time. Um, and because I ran it, I didn't have to ask for the time off, which was really, really useful. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so my whole business closed. That whole business closed because, of course, even now, couldn't dream of going into um, a childcare centre or a school and having kids jump all over you and run around and play, playing games and doing all that stuff. So that had all closed wow. and I was on JobKeeper and I got a phone call from my agent saying, um, just had a phone call from neighbours and they're wondering whether you would, you know, it's not an offer. That's what they say, not an offer. But would you be interested if they wanted to write you in just for a little moment? And I was like, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sort of almost bit his, um, you know, bit the phone off. Yes, yes, I will. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so it was supposed to be as, you know, it always is supposed to be, you know, a couple of episodes. Um, it was a couple of episodes, then oh, a couple more episodes, then, oh, let's get get you back next year. And then, um, yeah, I'm still officially a guest, but I'm in the opening titles and, <laughs> and I'm there pretty much most weeks, except for when we're not having a production break like we are now. Yeah. So, um, so, yeah, no, I'm, uh, it's great. It's fantastic. Yeah. So the pandemic was... Um, really strange <laughs> because this opportunity came back into my world, which it hadn't um, for 30 years. So it was pretty left of centre and pretty um, perfect timing. Thank you, universe. Feeling very grateful. Yeah. Do you, do you think once uh, kids and everything are vaccinated that you'll be able to continue on with the other business that you have? No idea. Yeah. I have no idea. I have no idea of what's going to happen. I mean, the under fives, I don't know whether they're ever going to be vaccinated. Yeah. yeah. So the under fives was, is the kinder age. Um, I think mm, schools will eventually go back to having incursions coming in again because the kids will be vaccinated. Yeah. Um, but I don't think the childcare centres um, 
and and less, you know, who knows what's going to happen? I mean, yeah. I just don't know. I just don't know. Great idea. I mean, great business. Yeah. 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 So it, it's just, um, it's, I still, I haven't sold anything. I've still got all of my equipment and all my stuff. And, and I'm like, oh, should I just try and sell? And I'm like, how do you sell a business that no longer exists? So, so it's all still here. And, you know, I'm I'll, sure it'll I'll be see. Fashion. It'll yeah, be. I'll see whether because I really loved it. It yeah. was um, it gave me so much joy um, working with the little ears. Just yeah. love it. Just they're just so full of fun and curiosity and um, joy. So um, yeah, I was sucking that up out of them. <laughs> Give me your joy. <laughs> um, now, let's talk about food. Do you cook? And if you do, do you have a signature dish? I'm not very good. <laughs> Neither am I. None of us are, the three of us. I've got a partner, my partner, who's, you know, works, you know, chopping down trees and stuff. He's a fantastic cook as well. <laughs> so I'm a bit blessed in that area. But I do do a nice roast. Can do a nice roast, do a nice gravy. Um, you know, make my own gravy. Don't use gravy box. Um, I make a nice tuna bake. Nice. Um, except for my stepdaughter won't eat it, so it mustn't be that nice. Um, <laughs> Some kids just don't um, like tuna. I don't know why. <laughs> well, she just she her food. She's been a vegan. She's been a she's she, her, she's all over the place with the food. So, um, so that's okay. I don't take it personally. Yeah. Um, and I, oh God, what else do I do? I do a nice um, sort of creamy seafood pasta. Nice. Yeah. yeah. She eats that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now going back to the um, binge watching TV, the streaming service. Yes. What do you? What's your favourite? What do you like? I loved Ted Lasso. Like, like to the point where I, I just, I feel such a hole in my life now that they're not all not there anymore. Um, I am currently adoring um, Morning Wars with Jennifer Aniston, who I didn't really like that much previously, and Reese Witherspoon. Um, just love it. Just yeah. fantastic. I suppose because I did a couple of years of live TV um, when I was in the UK, um, it's even funnier because, you know, you know what it's like. Um so I'm loving that. I loved the Queen's Gambit. I thought that was fantastic as well. Um, I loved Call My Agent, the French um, show mm. about agents, uh, acting agents. That is, if you haven't watched it, it's oh, I haven't seen it. the Brits are making a version of it. Um, so there will be a version in English, but it's it's kind of even better in French because they're so incredibly french it's it, it makes it funnier if you know what i mean um that is absolutely that would be my top notch ted lasso and call my agent would be my my two top those for binge watching fantastic i can't watch anything violent i've never watched games of Thro game of thrones I, I can't watch anything like that i'm absolutely a total and utter pink <laughs> it's comedy or romance or or or, or just naughty that's fine um <laughs> but yeah i can't do anything and i've got as i've got older i've got worse i can't i just can't deal with um with violence or yeah. hate stuff i just can't watch it I, it gets in my head and i, and I don't want it I don't want it get up get up yeah it's true though as you get older you, the, those things actually you want to watch them less yeah i, I yeah. can't watch them now yeah. I've got to the point now where I'm like, oh, is it violent? It's the first thing I say. Someone says, well, oh, you need to watch this. I go, oh, is it violent? <laughs> um, it's like, I think I'm a complete and utter wimp. She, who was in body melt, even, you know, where they just, people exploded left, right and centre. <laughs> <clears throat> so, um, yeah, sorry. Tell us a bit more about your time in the UK and, and what happened there. Oh, so much happened there. I can only tell you some things, Ken, okay? <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So, um, well, I went over to do Panto 
went over twice, two years in a row to do Panto. The second year I did Panto and I did a um, spring tour of the musical of Peter Pan, which was a bit like a band. I said it was a musical, but really, it was just a band. <laughs> okay, so, um, so I did that and, um, and I appeared on um, a show called Parallel Nine, which uh, my good friend Richard Norton was hosting at that time, who was in Neighbours as well. And um, he was having a bit of difficulty with the, um, with the way live television worked. It, it wasn't something that he was particularly comfortable with um, and he wasn't really enjoying it. Um, and um, so I think he said that he wasn't really enjoying it. And so I went on the show and they said, hey, would you and Richard like to host it together? And I was like, oh, that would be fun. Yes, please. And then I turned up to work and there was no Richard. Oh. It was just me. And, 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 and um, Richard had gone. They'd had a talk about it and he said he didn't really like it. And they said, well, we're going to get Lucinda in. And they were like, he was like, well, great. Which, of course, didn't do a whole lot for me and Richard's friendship at the time, I would imagine. Um, but, uh, yeah, so, so I all of a sudden had a job as a... Um, Two, two and a half hours of live television I was I, I was wow in front of um and you hadn't done that before the, no oh my god never what? never <laughs> earpiece you know counting down you know all that stuff open talk back in my head cameraman talk everyone I was like Aah! um you can probably find video of me going eh, 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 like that because I didn't know what the hell was happening. Um, but I did a lot of that for a couple of years. So uh, I did Parallel 9 went for two seasons. Um, so I stayed and did that. Um, and then I met a bloke and stayed there. Uh, I also did another um, Sunday morning show, which was called Highly Sprung. I keep forgetting all the names of the things that I was in. This is not going well. <laughs> um, Highly Sprung, which was on Sunday mornings. And that was super fun. I really enjoyed that. Um, and so, yeah, little bits and bobs kept coming. And so I just kept staying. Um, and then I got um, the Koala Brothers, which went for a number of years, went for three or four years. Um, and then I found out, uh, I went home because I'd come home pretty regularly and I came home in 2008 and um, my mum found out she had cancer. Mm. So I kind of had a bit of a, oh, realisation of like I'd missed out on my mum and my dad for the last sort of 16 <laughs> years when I'd been living in the UK, which was yeah. a long time. Um, so I kind of thought I had to come back. So um, I put my house on the market and then um, the um, GS, the, the, the um, what's it called? The global financial crisis oh, happened, yeah. GFC. And it took me nearly a year and a half, nearly two years to sell my house. Oh, wow. So I couldn't get home. So I kept going home, you know, when I could. And, and it was just, yeah, it was horrendous. Yeah. broke up with my partner you know all of those things um was really horrible um but i managed to get back in the end of 2009 and um by that time mum had recovered pretty much pretty well from her cancer and um yeah and then i came home and my dad got sick so it was sort of you know and then dad died later on that year so i'm really pleased that i came home when i did yeah, yeah eventually but um yeah it took me a while i had a great time in the uk i loved working in the theater i did edinburgh festivals i did stand up i worked with the comedy store players and doing improvisation um i worked with um all those guys that do the comedy store players we did shows in edinburgh together yeah. um i had a great time <laughs> did heaps of great plays new work worked for you know some really fantastic production houses and um and really you know 
I was having a really lovely life there and, and I really enjoyed it. But um, this thing just came knocking on my door going, oh, your mother, your father, come on. <laughs> and so <laughs> I'm not Jewish, but some Jewish part of me <laughs> or Catholic part of me or some guilt-ridden soul inside me said, you must go home. <laughs> so, so I did. So I returned home. Yeah. Like it good girl that I am yeah. and um my mum is still with us and she's 89 years old 89. and since, 89 and since then she has had uh she got over the cancer she's had two aortic valve replacements um two 12-hour open heart surgeries um she fell in love um and uh, had a fantastic relationship very late in her life with uh, a beautiful man um, who had only passed away last year at 94 oh. um, and she's brilliant um, she's up in Sydney um, she's still got a lot of heart problems she's you know she's not doing that well but it's fantastic to have been able to have this last 10 years um, you know being with her and making the most of her um, while she's here oh that's great yeah May, thanks for sharing that with us. That's all right. <laughs> um, now, Kim, we've covered a few questions with the UK. So, shall we go to the question about the Koala Brothers? Most ah, definitely. Yes. You voiced several characters in the Koala Brothers between 2003 and 2007. Yep. How did you get those parts? And what was it like being in a sound booth doing a voice instead of being on screen? It was, I think it's still possibly the, my favourite job that I've ever done. Oh, really? Mm. Because it doesn't have anything to do with how you look, <laughs> which is as an actress <laughs> or an actor, you know, and doesn't, doesn't have to be dance specific. It's so much is about how you look. And to be freed from that and to be able to make something anything you like so you know Mitzi was a boss, bossy possum and she sort of I've got it here hang on a minute oh really oh awesome I suddenly realized I should become a voiceover person oh that's this, adorable right so I don't know whether I don't think she's got any batteries but she sings and dances no her batteries are out sorry it's been a while since Mitzi's been called into action <laughs> <laughs> But, um, yeah, so she was, like, really bossy and had a voice like this and was like, oh, come on, everybody, what are you doing? You know, you've got to really do this. It's really important and that. So, so fantastic. Wow, that's thunder. Ooh, um, just so you know, it's not my stomach rumbling. <laughs> Um, yeah, and then I played Alice, who was sort of really breathy, and um, she was a platypus who rode a motorcycle, and she was kind of, like, really gorgeous. I thought of, like, mo you know, the motorcycle girl, Marianne Faithful, um, <laughs> a little red leather jacket. Um, Ken's getting what I'm saying. It's, it's, it's too early for you, Matt, <laughs> but a great movie to go back and look at at a later date. You'll love it. Um, <clears throat> So, yeah, and then there was this hilarious emu that ran um, an, a, 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 um, an ice cream van and her name was Lolly and she had a bit of a voice that went a bit up and down like this and she was like really crazy. <laughs> um, <laughs> so those three voices were also ridiculously different. Um, so there were times where I would have to speak to myself, each, each other, the characters would be talking to each other. And it was really funny because all the other actors in there were proper voiceover artists. That's all they did. And they just sat down and it all came out of them without them doing anything. Whereas I had to stand up and do like, <laughs> make all these faces. And, <laughs> <laughs> and they just thought I was the most ridiculous thing. Oh, look at the actor doing the things, you know. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, and I, I was all right because I got my back. Uh, I got my my um, my own back on them because none of them were were Australian. So as soon as they were starting to be nasty to me, I'd pull them up on their accents. 
of course. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I was the I was the accent Nazi. <laughs> no, you don't say it like that. You've got to say it like this. Use your diphthongs. <laughs> um, no, it was so much fun, and we also had um, Jonathan Coleman. Oh, um, yeah. Jonathan Coleman was our narrator. Oh wow! So Jono would come in and make us all fall around on the floor. Um, and do his little narrator bits. So, um, so yeah, he was the only other Australian on the show. Um, but, of course, his stuff was all um, sort of uh, the narrator stuff wasn't taught. He wasn't talking with us. He often just came in and did his and we'd just see him as he was leaving or so we didn't hang out with him so much. But um, it was fantastic um, when we did. Such a shame that he's gone. I know. Oh, it was such a shock. It was, it was mm. Yeah. Yes. But those voices are great. So you still do full think... level work, don't you? You're still doing yes. full level. Yeah. Yes, I yeah. do. I do. In fact, that's how we all came in contact. Yes. Because, um, yeah, Sue. because of Sue. So yeah, amazing Sue. Sue was my agent when I was 19. Oh, <laughs> she was the first at Melbourne Artist Management. She was, yeah, yeah. she's. So he's probably the same age as me. So we probably, yeah. So she's been my agent a couple of times during my life and is again now. So yeah. that's the joy. Yeah. I met her a few years ago. She's amazing. Great. great. Yeah, she's a fabulous girl. Is there any voiceovers we know that you're doing at the moment that if we heard it would be you? No, no, I don't think because I haven't really done a whole heap yet because we've only, I've only just reconnected with Sue. Um, so, yeah. So will. there will be. There will be for sure. So many voiceovers. <laughs> Definitely. Um, 2022 is going to be the year of the voiceover for me. It will be. <laughs> and Zooms. Um, now, we spoke about the Panamines, Ken, so we'll move on to our favourite show, Prisoner. <laughs> you appeared in two episodes of Prisoner. One very brief appearance as a receptionist in episode 576 and then one of, and then as one of Etty's girls, Mandy in episode 596. How did you get both parts and had you ever auditioned for any other parts in the show before? Yeah, well, uh, Jan Russ, the great Jan Russ was um, casting Prisoner at that time. Um, she had seen me for things for both neighbor, Neighbours and Prisoner. Um, just a, by the by, I auditioned for Jane Harris in Neighbours, and I also auditioned for Charlene. Really? <laughs> Obviously, I didn't get either of those jobs. Wow. Um, <laughs> uh, so, yeah, but Kylie and Annie were both with my agent, Melbourne Artist Management, at the time. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so I would have been sent out for an audition for Prisoner, um, or I reckon, actually, for both of those parts, because they were probably so little and... Jan would have already seen me for other stuff. Yep. I'd say I probably didn't even need to audition for those parts. Definitely not the receptionist. Maybe for Mandy, I may have had to go in and do a read, but I don't think I would have had to for the receptionist. That was like, I don't even know whether I had any lines for that one. <laughs> <laughs> Our producer, like, Jan, oh. actually found photos of you from Prisoner. Which I know. I couldn't yeah. believe it. When I saw them on Twitter, I was like, huh? <laughs> yeah. Well... I had brown hair then. Oh yeah, that's right. Because I'd just done a, I'd just done a, a documentary drama that Paul Cox directed called Handle with Care about breast cancer, which was also on Channel Ten. And I'd had my mum for that was Anna Maria Monticelli, who's a dark. So they dyed my hair really dark brown. Oh, okay. So I had a period of time of having this quite dark brown hair, which totally didn't suit me. <laughs> but, you know. You do it for the art, don't you? Yeah. You know what I'm <laughs> I never knew that you uh, auditioned for Charlene and, and Jane. That's a, yeah, I never knew that. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, you know, it's those calls go out and everybody yeah. at that agency who would have come into that range would have been seen for it. Yeah. 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 Had you um, watched Prisoner before you went on it? Was it a show that you yeah. were hoping to get on? I loved Prisoner. Yeah, yeah it's fantastic. 
Um, yeah, and I'm super great friends with so many people that were that were in Prisoner. Um, Jackie Gordon is one of my very best friends. Oh, Jackie. Um, yeah. Who played Susan... Driscoll, yeah. Yes, Driscoll, yeah. that's right. Susie Driscoll. Susie Driscoll, oi! Um, so, yeah, yeah. So J Jack's still one of my great, great friends. Yeah. Um, I see her all the time. Uh, we were uh, in Power and the Passion together. Um, Jane Clifton also um, was in Power and the Passion with me as well um, and was in Prisoner. Um, yeah, Sally Bourne. Yeah. I don't know whether you know Sal. Sally's um, coming Sally. on next week. Ah, uh, this week. Oh, fantastic. Well, Sal yeah. and I used to do a comedy act together in the UK. Wow. Sal and I met each other because, of course, I'd worked with Ernie, her dad, yeah. on Neighbours. And Sally and I were cast in a play in London together, both playing Australian um, parts. And we became, you know, inseparable, completely inseparable. And then we started to say, we're both so absolutely hilarious, we need to write comedy together. <laughs> and we did. We wrote a huge amount of comedy together. We did a whole lot of stand-up together um, for a fair few years. And then she... Uh, went came back to australia and had babies so um so that stopped she left me high and dry actually <laughs> so when you interview her just let her know yeah. you just left lucinda in, in england by herself <laughs> to do comedy with people that weren't nearly as funny as her okay and how very dare she <laughs> <laughs> And it's interesting, um, you brought up Fiona Court before. So Ernie yeah. played her dad on Her that. dad, exactly. Yes. Ernie yeah. played her dad, yeah. yeah. Rob the mechanic yes. in Neighbours. That's right. Yeah. I know. It's just when you start having conversations like this, you just go, oh, my God, that's sort of the increments. But, you know, we have a very small industry here. Yeah. So I suppose, I mean, Sal and I could not understand that we hadn't met each other before. <laughs> we were like, how come I haven't met you? You're funny. Um, and and I was like, oh, I know your dad. So, yeah, so we just, um, yeah, we became best friends. And because we were both um, Aussies in London trying to do, you know, the same sort of thing, she was working in musical theatre during that period of time. Yeah. Um, she was, like, in Jesus Christ Superstar. She was, so she was, like, you know, head girl on this and, and all that sort of stuff. So she was very much musical theatre. Um, but she wanted to do more acting and she wanted to do comedy and stuff like that. So, um, yeah. And she she gives me singing lessons when I need them. Wow. She also teaches my stepdaughter. <laughs> yeah, so it's all what goes around comes around, yeah. Would you ever do stand-up comedy again? I love stand-up comedy. Look, I found it. I loved working with Sal. I, I love doing a, a duo, but I found it lonely. Um, yeah. I found it a really lonely place being up there by myself, you know, <laughs> going to gigs, driving around by myself, going to another gig. I didn't like it. Oh. I was like, mm. Uh, and also, this was in the UK. This, I haven't done stand-up here. Okay. Um, but when I was in the UK, I found it a little bit of a not a very friendly to females place, I must say. Okay. Those green rooms where it's all the boys and, and you walk in and all of a sudden it goes quiet. They're all, like, laughing and having a great time and, yeah, and the girl comes in and it's like, it's like, uh, no, I, I, I'm funny too. Come on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> don't just stop because I'm here. And it's like, no, nah, we can't say stuff like that. Women, you know, I don't know what it was. Maybe they felt themselves that they didn't want to come across like that. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. But I just didn't find it a very female friendly. Um, and this is the late 90s, early 2000s, I suppose. I didn't find it a particularly, it didn't didn't go yes yes Lucinda this is what you want to do you know mm -hmm. I I found I like writing comedy stuff still I you know I still do a bit of that and I but I like the I like the give and take I like offering something somebody else offering something else I, I, I don't like just doing it on my own um you sometimes you can use the audience we have got a great audience other times the audience don't want to play and and <laughs> I, I, I didn't 
feel good about that when that happened. I didn't like the dying on stage bit. <laughs> that wasn't so fun. Um, and when there's nobody else there to go, hey, look at what an idiot I'm making of myself. Um, it was, <laughs> it was, yeah. I so I was kind of like, you yeah, know, yeah, it was three o'clock. I'm in Clapham, and I've got to drive back to Brighton. Um, you know, it was sort of like. I'm sure there's other ways that I can make more money and have more fun. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Um, now, we covered Ken's question about people you know on Prisoner, but my one is, had you hoped for a, more of a regular role on Prisoner at the time? Oh, yeah, I totally would have. Yeah, yeah of course. <laughs> of course. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I couldn't see where Mandy was going to go. Yeah. <laughs> couldn't see her trajectory as one of Eddie's girls, you know, <laughs> to, to get in, maybe inside and causing some, I don't know. I think I, I was pretty young at that stage and I think it was just a really fantastic experience for me to, to work with, you know, um, some people that I'd seen on the telly and also to work with the sort of, you know, three or four camera scenario and stuff like that, which I probably hadn't done. Um, because, you know, you, you come out of drama school here and you actually haven't really done the sort of work that you're going to have as an Australian actor. You yeah. know, you do all this fantastic theatre work and stuff like that, you know, at drama school and it sets you up. And we don't have careers like that here. You can't survive as an actor if you just do theatre work in Australia, you know. So, unfortunately, we didn't learn what how to work in a multi-camera situation or any of that sort of stuff at drama school, which... Um, when I teach, I, I think is super important because yep. if you've got all of that stuff, the, mm. the technicalities of everything down, then you can act, if you know what I mean. If you're still thinking about the technicalities, then you're not thinking about how you should be feeling or, or what your character's going through or, or you know, or how best to, to show that. Um, so I, I, I think it was a bit of a shock at the beginning. And, and it was also, I felt the same when I started in um, The Power and the Passion, same thing, um, really fast working. Um, and, and, it, and you don't really learn that at drum school. You probably do now, um, but you didn't back then, which was yeah. a shame. So it was, yeah, I would have loved to have worked there longer. I would have loved yeah. to have been a proper... Inmate. Um, inmate. Yeah. <laughs> Episode 576, you had a very brief scene with Ma Maggie Kirkpatrick and Margot Knight. What were they like to work with? I just remember Maggie being hilarious, like just so funny, so warm yeah. and just hilarious. Just, I don't remember. Uh, Margot, oh, Margot, of course, played Lou. She was hilarious as well. So they were hilarious. And Gerda Nicholson um, was also in the scene that we did with um, the yeah. other scene yeah. that we did, not the scene yeah. with, um, with um, oh, God, all the names. Maggie, um, all the names are backing up in my head. <laughs> and um, one was uh, Lois Ramsey, yeah. Yes. 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 She was so brilliant. Yeah. She's so funny really hilarious so yeah I just remember that all being fun yeah. yeah and 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 you know and Maggie just having the crew in fits which you know I would imagine you'd know all about Ken yeah <laughs> yes of course yeah, no she was funny yeah we actually did we, we interviewed Maggie yesterday part two and um yeah she, she's oh, fantastic. yeah yeah um Episode 596, which you played, Mandy, it's actually, a, it's, it's a fan favourite, this episode. It's on YouTube and there's a lot of comments about you because you uh, had a really funny line where, uh, where you told Anne that have a word to him, he might listen to you because you're old. And <laughs> that's the Gerda Nicholson. Um, yeah, so it's a funny episode. Very funny episode. <laughs> I'll have to go and re-watch it. Yeah. <laughs> It's particularly hilarious now because I'm so old. I bet it can. Gerda probably um, took that in her stride as, as a line and, and thought, yeah, righto, I'll work with that. Yeah. Did, 
did you yeah. ever meet anyone else while you were there or just the people you did your scenes with so did you did you hook up with any other cast members i don't really remember that well um ken i only really remember the people that i did the scenes with and i think back in those days um it wasn't quite as sort of rushed i think as it is now i think there was more we had a rehearsal day um and and so we would have had a rehearsal day and then a couple of days later shot it i think that was the way we did it then yeah um so yeah i think i probably would have come across some of the other actors in the show but yeah i, I don't remember having anything significant with them yeah now we want to be uh, appreciate your time because we I'm just keeping an eye on the time, so we might move to neighbours if that's okay, Ken. Yeah. With a few questions. So, for those that don't know, if they've been living under a rock, Neighbours first aired on Channel Seven on the 18th of March, 1985. Then it was Axe and Channel Ten picked it up and aired it on the 20th of January, 1986. In 2005, it won the Logie Hall of Fame and has ran for over 8,751 episodes so far and is wow. the longest running drama series in Australia. Now, you were initially in it for seven episodes and your first episode was 544, which I watched the other night. <laughs> Very funny episode. That aired on the 30th of July, 1987. You were the girlfriend of Henry Ramsey, played by Craig McLaughlin, being introduced to a horrified Madge, Scott and Sharon. <laughs> Charlene, with the very unforgettable laugh. How did you get the role of Melanie? <clears throat> it's really funny. I was <clears throat> talking to, at the Christmas party, I was talking to one of the girls um, and I was with Annie Jones. Um, and of course, I've known Annie forever. Um, and Annie, Annie's partner, Paul Maloney, who I don't think she was married to at this point, um, but he did the audition with me for Melanie. And I'd already auditioned, as I'd said, for a number of other characters in Neighbours. And I can't remember whether I'd seen Paul, but I had met Paul before. Um, and I think I'd met him because Fiona and Annie were already like super, super, super really good friends then, Fiona Cork and Annie Jones. Um, so I think I'd met Paul with Fiona and Nick and Annie and, and, and just socially. Um, and he said, okay, so, look, there's not really much. They didn't have any dialogue that Melanie was going to say, so I didn't have any script. So they'd sent me a script from, um, oh, God, uh, the Henderson Kids. Oh, the Henderson Kids. Yes. <laughs> Which Kylie Minogue was on. That was her one what? of the yes, Kylie yes, Minogue was, yes. yeah. And, and I think Annie was on too. Yes, yes. Think, yeah, yeah. Um, everyone was on. I wasn't, but everybody else was. <laughs> uh, and um, Paul, I think, had directed Hendo's. I think, I think that's where Annie and him had met. And anyway, so he said I, I, there was a bit of uh, dialogue which had been Toddy Goldsmith's character that she played on um, Hendo's, um, which was a hairdresser who was a bit dippy. I think so there was a little tiny bit of dialogue of somebody else from a totally different show <laughs> welcome to being an Australian actor and um this uh information about the laugh okay so um so I did a little bit of dialogue and he was like yeah that's all good but this laugh that's the that's the trick we just need someone who can do you know this this stupid laugh and you know I've been to drama school so we'd done those animal works where you have to, you know, play a character that is dog-like or a woman that is bird-like or, you know, all that sort of stuff that you do at drama school. So this said that they wanted somebody who could laugh like a cross between a donkey braying and a seal honking <laughs> um, was the information that was on the audition sheet. So I was like, mm, okay, mm, 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 you know, trying to work out where it would come from, all that sort of stuff. So I did, did it in the audition and Paul just completely cracked up. He was just like, that is hilarious. Um, so I felt quite good getting out of that audition, thinking that, you know, 
I wonder what other people are going to offer. Well, nobody offered what I offered. So, <laughs> so I got the part. Wow. And and I was like, you know, it's a tiny little thing in neighbours, blah, 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 you know. And, you know, I think, you know, when you've been to drum school and you're sort of ready for your career, you don't sort of envisage that it's, you know, it's going to be neighbours. You think it's going to be, you know, yeah, Academy Award nominated <laughs> Hollywood film or, you know, incredible, important theatre piece or, you know, you kind of have this kind of idea rather than, you know, making a name for yourself as someone who did this ridiculous seal laugh. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so it was, yeah. And then I, I thought I'd do it once or twice and that would be the end of it. And, and then they kept, kept coming back. It was like, oh, I have to do that stupid laugh again. Oh, oh God, I have to do it. Oh God, I have to do it for three years. <laughs> um, <laughs> And then 30 years later, oh, my God, I'm still doing it. <laughs> <laughs> Be careful what you wish for. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, that's been my career trajectory. Pretty yeah. much. <laughs> you, you first appeared in, in episode 544, um, that was the episode when Des and Daphne had a baby by the river and, and um, Henry brings you home to meet Madge, Charlene, Scott, and you say to Henry, do you all live here together in this house? <laughs> Henry says, oh, it's okay. It has thick walls. And then we hear Melanie's famous laugh and the look on Madge's face was unforgettable. It was, was just, it, it was so much fun because... Um, because I, I had this trick to do, if you know what I mean. I had this thing that I would pull out and everybody would go, oh, my God. But did they, did um, they know that laugh was coming? Because they, they looked like genuine. They were all expecting something, but they didn't know what it was going to uh, be like. Okay. I think it was Tony Osica that directed the episode. Um, and he was like, don't do it until, don't, if they, even if they ask you, don't do it until, you, until the actual thing. Because he said, I don't want them to hear it beforehand. Yeah. Um, so be I'd done it, obviously, for Tony had heard it on the when I did the audition. So he was like, no, I don't want. And so that shock, that was genuine. <laughs> wow. That was genuine. I thought it was. <laughs> <laughs> like um, Carlton's yeah. face, it was, it was priceless. The look. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, it was just, they just all liked me immediately because I just did this stupid thing. Yeah. So it was great for me because you weren't just one of 300 other guests that they'd seen that week, if you know what I mean. So it yeah. um, made me feel good because they were all laughing and <laughs> thought I was really funny. And are you really going to do that? Is that like, you know, is that really, and you're going to keep doing that? And how do you do it? <laughs> and, you know, all that sort of the techni technical aspect. Yeah. Making such a cacophony, <laughs> and whether I could do it, you know, at any time, it was like it's like, well, I thought I was only going to have to do it a couple of times, and that was going to be it. And so, <laughs> but no, no, the universe had other plans. Yeah. Well, my next question was about the laugh. Can you still do the laugh? Yeah, I I, st I do it all the time. I, I still do it on <laughs> neighbors. <laughs> I still have to do it on neighbors. Oh, so, still yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Melanie still has that laugh. It's her calling card. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so yeah, so yeah, I still have to do it. I still pull it out every now and then. But you know, it depends on the storyline. I've had some really heavy storylines in the last um, year. So there's been, not been a huge amount of time for getting the laugh in. Laugh, yeah. <laughs> I try to get it in whenever I can because I just, I kind of think, gee, she hasn't laughed for a while. We need to get some laughing in. Could you do the laugh for us now or is that too much? Of course I could. <laughs> <laughs> it's just quite a toned down version today. Yeah. Because <clears throat> it sometimes makes me cough. I have to have yeah, does it, does it hurt to laugh like that? Um, when you get on a roll with it, it's really easy. Yeah. And you haven't done it for a while because I have, because I've been on holidays. <laughs> I haven't done it for a while. It's a bit like, it's like starting up a car that hasn't been started up for a while. It's a bit sort of clunky, and then you sort of get into it, and it's like, oh, you can just like, oh, it's okay, I can do it just like that now. 
So yeah, so yeah. No, thank you for that. The fans will love it. It's in my it's in my tool, my tools, my armory. I yeah. have it as my my acting armory. <laughs> Good. Your uh, your first episode also starred Myra De Groot. Do you have any memories of working with Myra, who played Des's mum, and yeah. was also telling Madge that you had different men coming in and out of your house every night? Yes. Well, Melanie's always been a bit of a slap up. <laughs> <clears throat> Don't tell Toady. Oh no, he knows now. He knows it's okay. <laughs> Everybody knows now what a slapper Melanie is. But, yeah, she was apparently always a bit of a slapper. <laughs> um, so, so she hasn't changed much. But she's she's settling down now. Um, sorry, what was the actual question, again? Uh, your memories of working with Myra. With Myra. Um, just, I was just completely in awe of Myra. Yeah. You know, an incredible comedian, comedic talent, just incredible. Her and um, Viv, uh, Vivian, who played Mrs. Mangle yes. together, were like seriously brilliant comedy. They were just amazing. Um, she was so um, I just just watched, you know, if you know what I mean. I just watched her and took in as much as I possibly could. Yeah. Because she was like, I don't know, I don't know. She was proper old school, funny, just really, really, really funny. And and her business, the business that she did, that all that sort of, oh my, just incredible, <laughs> just incredible, fantastic. Yeah. Um, just thought she was amazing. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, as as a supposedly, you know budding mm. comedian mm. I suppose in those days which I may have been considered to be um yeah I just wanted to to watch her and um and I you know I don't think we got to do too many scenes together but a few scenes we definitely got to do together there was stuff about um a cake competition church cake competition <laughs> where Melanie ended up winning with her <laughs> pig cake and she put a lot of noses out of joint Myra's being one of them and Charleston's being another one you know you don't want to get those two you know they're two noses you don't want to get <laughs> out of your, you know what I mean <laughs> um yeah but also you know just loved working with Anne as well Charleston both the Anne's and Hattie and um I loved working with the older actors I just just would suck it up you know just their all of their their knowledge and their generosity, just incredible. They were always incredibly generous to me. Must have been amazing working with Vivian, Mrs. Mangle. I mean, what a what an iconic character she created. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, yeah she was just amazing. And and you know, she still lives on. She's still that picture is still in, you know, the set. Um, the picture oh, the, of Mrs. Yeah, Mangle. Yeah, yeah that um uh the, um and Hattie's character play uh, painted is yeah. still there. So, you know, um, yeah, she still um, oversees us. That's amazing. From a distance. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Um, now you return the following year for a further six episodes as Paul Robinson's temporary secretary. Despite being a nightmare to work with, he realized that you were good at your job and kept you on. Then you moved in with poor old Des Clark, who was this by this point a widower, Daphne had passed on. Um, what are your memories of working with, well, well, you still do work with Stefan and I'm sure Paul's been back on recently as well. Yes, he um, has. In fact, yeah. my first episodes back were with Paul, Yeah. Um, which was gorgeous to see him. Um, and, yeah, look, Steph I still see, obviously. Um, but, yeah, I, I just, um, I, it was, it was um, Des and a Mike, so Guy Pierce oh, yeah. and... Uh, and Jeff Payne, Clive, um, oh, yes. Clive Gibbons. That's who I lived with when I first came into the show. I first came into the show and I lived with all of those oh, boys. Wow. <laughs> yeah, Melanie and all of those guys. So don't even think about what happened. What was that? <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, so yeah, so poor Des was, um, he was bereft uh, and grieving. Um, and yeah, Melanie is really not very aware of um, stuff, although she was quite protective of Des. Um, it used to sort of end up in in ways that Des didn't really want, but um, but yeah, he she was she was quite protective of him. Um, and yeah, he was great to work with, and they all were. They all fantastic. They all still are fantastic. Yeah. I love doing scenes with Jeff, and we occasionally get to do like little two handers, and and it's just so much fun. It's just so much fun. And the same with Steph. I've had some lovely little just you know one on one scenes with him um, <clears throat> that reflect his uh, their history, and and yeah. it's really nice to be able to do that. Definitely. Um, you, you then left to join the cast of The Power, uh, The Power, The Passion. But mm -hmm. what returned to Neighbours following that show being cancelled? It turned out at the time that Annie Jones had decided not to renew her contract as Jane Harris and you were offered to rejoin as a regular. How did you feel about that? Once again, fantastic timing. Um, I had actually got the sack from the power and the passion. Oh. <laughs> Me Ooh. and Jackie Gordon both got cut, got axed um, in a shake up to the show because the show wasn't doing very well. So it was actually just before they decided not to continue on with the show. <laughs> um, but at the time I was absolutely gutted. Um, because it had been my first sort of big regular telly role, I suppose, and I just assumed that it was going to continue on. Um, so, so me and Jack uh, both left the show, and we were both um, pretty gutted at the time. Um, and it was really strange because the director's assistant that was working on the Power and the Passion um, said, who was a really good friend of Mark Callens, who was the then producer of Neighbours, and <clears throat> she said, "You know what?" I think you should give Mark a call because he really, really liked you on Neighbours. And I think, you know, if he knew that you weren't on this, he'd be interested. And I was like, I can't call Mark Keller, sort of thing. And she was like, can't you? And I was like, no, <laughs> too scared. He's a producer. She was like, oh, shall I call him for you? And I went, oh, would you? And she went, yeah. And so she rang Mark and said, I just wanted to let you know that Lucinda has been let go from Power and the Passion. And, and it just serendipitously turned with him just finding out that Annie was leaving the show. And Annie was the secretary at Lassiter's, well, was Paul's sec EP or whatever you call them in those days. They were <laughs> <laughs> yes, receptionist. Um, <laughs> So, um, <clears throat> so yeah, so it just, they, uh, Mark went, well, Melanie could work in the office. You know, I think his head just went into writing how this could work. And he said, come in and have a meeting with me, Lucinda. And I was like, <laughs> and um, so I did. And um, so they, I then came in for a little while longer and then they extended me and I was there for three years. Yeah. So that's how that happened. It's pretty weird, isn't it? <clears throat> All the ways that I can get jobs. <laughs> <laughs> so in um, 1991, your, Melanie was set to marry Simon Hunter, but eventually ended up marrying Mrs. Mangle's son, Joe Mangle, played by Mark Little. What was it like being a part of that storyline and working with Mark? Oh, look, Mark was great fun. Um, he was great fun to work with, a really good actor. Um, uh, and, um, yeah, no, we had, we had a lot of fun working together. So um, that, was, that was pretty good. Um, I also really loved working with Fred Whitlock, who um, played Simon. Yeah. And now that I know that, you know, Joe and Mel didn't work, I kind of think, wonder what would have happened with <laughs> Mel and Simon? <laughs> Can they get Simon back on the show to see what, you know, maybe they could bump into each other at Lassiter's and there could be fraction between Melanie and Toadie and Simon. <laughs> um, anyway. 
Lasted I don't know. I was totally <laughs> shocked when I found out that Joe and Mel broke up. I was I was flabbergasted. I thought that they were driving off into the sunset to live happily ever after. Um, so I was slightly shocked at that. I was so, so yeah. yeah. But it's okay because <laughs> it didn't really happen. It's not real life. <laughs> Okay. You were, you worked on Body Melt in 1993 with Ben, ben Gurens, who had played your stepson, Toby Mangle, in Neighbours. What was it like working with him again? Well, it wasn't long after. It was actually not long at all after. I think, just wondering whether Ben was still in Neighbours at that point. I can't remember. But it was not long after I'd left Neighbours. And the thing about Body Melt and me is that I played one of the few characters that didn't explode. That is my, um, <laughs> that's my claim to fame in Body Melt. I'm only in it for a few seconds. I play, once again, a receptionist because obviously just look at me and all you can see is receptionist. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, yeah, so, uh, it was, um, it was great fun. And funnily enough, the producer on that show, um, Daniel Scharf, is now my agent. <laughs> so, yeah, um, I think he thought, yeah, I'm going to get the girl who didn't explode. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, that, that sounds like a credit. Yeah. Girl who doesn't explode, we'll get yes. her. Yes, exactly. get the ones that don't explode. <laughs> um, I can't really remember if my scene was with Ben. I can't remember. Uh, it was, I was, I was, it wasn't just any kind of receptionist. I was actually a record, it was a record company's receptionist. So I was a bit oh, of a yeah. high up <laughs> music industry receptionist. <laughs> <laughs> Um, now we just spoke about the that was my next question was about the marriage with uh, Joe and Melanie so we'll move over to Ken's question about Mark Little coming back yeah Mark Little returned to the show himself in 2005 yes uh, where his character had a relationship with Lynn Scully played by Janet Anderwatha did you have any idea that he was returning to the show Yes, I did, because Mark was in the UK at that time and he'd told me that he was going back. Yeah, yeah. So I knew, I knew that that was happening. We were still in contact with each other. Um, so, yeah, so I knew he was going back. Um, I don't think I knew that he was having an affair with Andrew, uh, Andrea. <laughs> yes, anyway, I don't think I knew that. So I may have been slightly shocked. <laughs> <laughs> Janet, who played uh, Reb Keen on Prisoner as well. Of Great course. Actress. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, she's brilliant. About... She's a brilliant actress. I really love. Uh, I really love Janet, and I thought she was great in Neighbours as well. She's great in everything she does. Yeah, definitely. Um, now we spoke about your return to Neighbours, so we'll move to Ken's question about the show. How, how has the show changed in the seventy or eighty years it's been going, <laughs> or whatever? What is the time it's not? It's been seventy going. or eighty years since you were last in it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, it's changed heaps. It's changed heaps. Um, you know, the cameras are different, Ken. <laughs> oh, I know. I know. I worked at, uh, I worked at in about uh, 96 and they've got these tiny little cameras. Yes. Tiny, tiny. Yeah. With the you little... think of those things you used to have to push around. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. no. They're, they're different. Um, we, it's a different way we film, though. Um, compared to what we used to do. We used to have rehearsals on one day and filming on another day and all that sort of stuff. Now everything's together. So you just rehearse record. So that makes a big difference for us as actors, definitely. I much prefer a rehearsal where you're blocked and then you come back and you record it rather than I like that time in between for my head, if you know what I mean. So I can put my words and the actions and everything together. Um, <clears throat> but that's just a personal point. I think a lot of other people actually really like the rehearse record situation. Um, so that's different. Um, we were we shoot six episodes a week now, 
I think. Oh, wow. Yeah. A block is six episodes. So that's, yeah, that's more than there was. But Hard the cast work. is a lot bigger. Yeah. So the workload is pretty much the same. Um, and, you know, we have all these weird, um, uh, like, uh, filmy things that are windows that are um, oh, in the yeah. waterhole and stuff now we, we're... <laughs> We, we, that aren't real and and I got a shock when I <laughs> I was first in there and there it was um it, it was people there <laughs> and I couldn't quite work it out and uh yeah so so there's lots of different things there's it's, it's different the way they film it it's um it's different the way it's filmed um it's all on digital it's um yeah so it's quite different and then there's all the COVID things because I've only been at Neighbours since their COVID plan has been in place so of course you know um we're all masked up we all wear the screens as well um and um yeah so you know the crew that you know once they take their masks off you you're like who, who are you <laughs> So yeah, it is. It's different. It's um, and of course, there's different people. It's a much larger cast than it was when I was working there. I think we only had fifteen or so regular characters then, and I think there's at least twenty one or two now. And there's a few people like me that are regular characters, but they don't actually. They're not really regular, you know. Yeah. So yeah. like uh, Jeff Payne as well, um, Richard Huggett, who's come in as a guest, who's sort of. Yeah, going to be in for a while. So, um, yeah. So there's it's it's a lot of people. There's a lot more storyline going on. I think than there used to be a lot more. Um, uh, I think it's a much bigger show to write now than I think it was before, which I don't know is necessarily a good thing, if you know what I mean. Because I actually think the heart of Neighbours is 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 about the interaction between. Yeah. the fences if you know what I mean that's where I actually think that neighbors is what's special about it and what people relate to about yeah, it it's such a different show now compared to back in the 80s and, and 90s like yeah. exactly what you said yeah, yeah. Over the fence it, was, and, it was all like gardening competitions and cake yeah. competitions and 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 things between whereas it's it got sort of a bit um I don't know, like an American soap or something where it was all about, you know, battles of businesses and that sort of, and, and I just don't think myself, this is completely a personal viewpoint, that 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 is the nub of what Neighbours is about. Yeah. I don't think it's about business battles and stuff. I think it's, you know, about that person over there is doing something weird in their backyard. What is it? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> What's he making over there? What are they building? You know, it's like what what noise is coming out of that house? This is Mangle always looking at the someone over there, or are they having a great time? I can't work it out. I think, you know, that's kind of what the the nub of neighbours was about to me. It was about sticky beaking other people's <laughs> business, really. That's why Myra de Groot and, you know, Vivian Grey and those characters are still the ones we remember from Neighbours because it was about sticking your nose into somebody else's life. <laughs> and that's, of course, you know, what we all do now watching reality television, if you know what I mean. So it's, I don't know, maybe they needed to do something different to combat that. I don't know. But um, I think it's it, it should be, mm, that's just my personal point of view. Yeah. Um, not, I'm not important enough to necessarily have that point of view, <laughs> but you know, it's, it's, yeah, it's just, I, I just think it's about the little things, um, <clears throat> making the little things big rather than making big things little. Yeah. Mm. I said that to Ken yesterday. I said, I was, I've gone back and watched a lot of Neighbours episodes and I, I grew up watching Neighbours back then. And uh, I just said it had so much warmth back then and it was yeah. so different and exactly what yeah. you said. But I yeah. guess they've got to, you know, they've got to please the advertisers and everyone now. And Absolutely. Oh, yeah, absolutely. There's just, um, and also because, you know, it, it, it's, um, it's been going for such a long time and, and I suppose every show goes through periods of, you know, um, 
troughs and hills and you know we all have high points and low points during those yeah during those many 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 years i think it's 37 years wow. that will will be this this year will be a 37th year so um so yes yeah, so that's that's a long time to come up with just little storylines i suppose <laughs> about next door neighbors you know so so they've gone down you know a couple of cul-de-sacs pardon the um <laughs> pun that probably were you know weren't winners but you know that i think that happens with every show yeah that's yeah. on for that for a length of time yeah yeah no i agree um now we've, we've run out of time unfortunately i'm yeah it's 12 30 i'm okay to keep going my friend has said let's do it another time so that's all good are you sure so, do you mind staying a little bit longer Okay. Yeah, I'm absolutely fine to stay a little bit longer. Oh, fantastic. Um, where are we up to, Ken? I think we're on the... Uh, we did your question. Yes, we, we did. A, yeah. Um, now, has Melanie changed in ways that you hoped from back when you were originally on it to now? Oh, my light just turned off again. <laughs> <laughs> At least um, they have not barked. Here I am in the dark. Um, <clears throat> It was almost fortuitous. Has Melanie changed? <laughs> she has. <laughs> um, no, it wasn't dramatic effect. I'm not that clever <laughs> and not very technically gifted. Um, she has changed. I think she's a bit more bolshy than she was, but I think she was also a, a little bit bolshy, you know, like the beginnings of someone who was going to be bolshy. Um, <laughs> I really love and, and I appreciate so enormously the great job that the writers have done with bringing Mel back. Yeah. Um, I just, as soon as I looked at the script when I got it, it I knew what to do with it. It just jumped. I, I, it, was like, it was like I just plugged into 1987. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just, you know how, you, I mean, the stress of, of thinking, all I can do is is ruin a character that is incredibly well loved. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I was really scared that, and and particularly I must say that I thought that um, it was a shame what happened with Mark's character when he came back. I thought that that was a bit, it was a bit decimated the the niceness of Joe. Yeah. Um, I thought it was a bit nasty and and I thought that was a bit of a shame. And and so there was a little bit inside me that thought maybe that was gonna happen with Mel. And, you know, is she gonna turn out to be some, you know, crazy, you know, killer or, you know, something horrible, if you know what I mean. You just don't know. And they didn't tell me anything, of course. Oh, I just okay. said yes so quickly before they can say anything, you see. <laughs> Um, so I just didn't know what was going to happen. Um, so when I read those first few scripts, I was just, it just was like nothing had changed and she was still exactly that same nutty, over the top, um, overly opinionated, telling everybody what she thinks they should do, you know, not having any experience in any of these things, but having an opinion regardless. Um, sort of you know I, I just I was so pleased I was just I, I think they've done a great job of, cool. of bringing her back sympathetically um yeah. there's been a couple of twists that I really wasn't expecting like I really wasn't expecting the relationship with Toadie Toadie yes <laughs> I, my face when I started reading all of that and also just the fear of like getting my 55 year old body out in front of you know if you know what I mean because I had to do all this uh, oh <laughs> um <laughs> I was like what really yeah. and, and you know just thinking how much younger is he than me it must be like 15 years or something and so I, I was just like oh god they're just gonna be they're just gonna hate me because he's like the most well-loved character yes. in Neighbours ever been on the show for 28 years and and you know ah. so that that sort of scared me slightly um until of course I started working with Ryan yeah and 
he's just amazing. He's fantastic. Mm -hmm. He's brilliant. I love working with him. And I am so incredibly pleased that we were paired up um, because we just have the best time working together. He's just so much fun and so ridiculously professional and on top of what you what he's going to do and what you're going to do and how the scenes it's just you just it just feels like flying with him if you know what i mean he's just great fun whatever i throw in he throws in something else we we offer each other stuff all the time and i think um i think you can tell that with our scenes i, I think that they it works really well yeah. even though on paper what are you doing <laughs> <laughs> um yeah so i just assumed that i was gonna probably end up with paul robinson is probably is, you know as another disastrous relationship of paul robinson's so i'm so pleased <laughs> i was hoping to hear what you said about mark middle's character that joe because it was so not in his character to have an affair i mean really it was it would have been great to see you guys go back together yeah, yeah. I, look, I just thought it was, um, it just, I just don't think it was very sympathetic to the character. Um, yeah. And and also because um, he was with Janet as well, who was also, you know, had, had done such a great job building up her character. And, yeah. um, and I also thought there was a real similarity between um, Shane, um, who played Andrea's oh, yeah. husband on Neighbours. Yeah. Yeah. And Mark as well. I thought there was, there was, a, they, they're quite similar kind of, uh, they were quite similar characters. Definitely. Um, so, yeah, so I thought they kind of just tried to turn him into him. That's what I felt. Yeah. It was like, oh, oh. So, yeah, I just thought that was a bit of a shame. Yeah. Actually, there was a time when Lynn and Paul were together as well on Neighbours. Oh, yes, there was. Yes. That was a, that was yeah, a no, there, look, there's, you Just point to any woman that is in the show and you'll go, oh, yeah, of course. There was, yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> poor old Melanie had a one night stand with him back in the day. So, um, yeah. Lucky she didn't go back for seconds there. That's all I can say. <laughs> <laughs> now, the next, the next question is. In fact, going to be a bit of a spoiler alert, so we're not going to go there. Um, so back to you again, Matt. And we've just covered Toadie, so that's uh, that's all good. So we'll move on to Ken. Sorry. <laughs> You're handballing it back to me again. What would you like to see happen for Melanie going forward? Um, well, she's had a bit of a sort of an upsetting year with her work because she worked <clears throat> she's a really good as we all know fantastic um receptionist <laughs> no sorry executive something assistant that's it um uh, yeah so i think she kind of needs to find her work feet again um because she had all of this stuff come out about her having affairs with everybody that she worked with <laughs> Um, and um, so, which of course caused some ruptions between her and Toadie because she was obviously still working for Toadie. So he thought he was just one of the many notches on Mel's belt, um, uh, which of course, you know, he was, he's so much more than that to Mel, but I think it would be good for her to find a new job. So, and um, I know there is some stuff about that coming up. She's going to be working with, um, one of the other people that live in Toadie's house. Okay. I don't know how much I can give away. No, but anyway, <laughs> um, she's going to be doing some, some work. Um, but it's not quite what you'd be expecting her to do. But I would really love Mel to have some sort of wellness ah, yes. operation. Yeah. I would like her to have some sort of bark flower remedy sort of thing that she does some sort of witchy thing that she that she does terrible things with and she makes mistakes with and I actually would really like a storyline where she's actually giving people medical marijuana and doesn't realize it <laughs> Randy Street, yes that's what I would really like to see but <sighs> right <laughs> <laughs> no, whether that's very six o'clock. <laughs> but I, I think I would love to see something like that happen. 
I have no, I don't, I, I have no hope that it will, but <laughs> regardless, I think that would be a fantastic storyline. What's it well, like? It doesn't it? necessarily have to be medical marijuana, but it could be, Funny you know, else. something that she's, she, that is making people off their heads. <laughs> That she's giving them that they're all loving and they're coming back for more and more just thinking that it's this sort of nice little wellness product <laughs> rescue remedy Let's do that, definitely <laughs> is um so, yeah so that's what i'd like to see i like the kooky stuff with mel i like it when she's you know talking with madame zolga and doing all this sort of kooky stuff that she does yeah no, definitely. Is Neighbours the type of show that you're able to approach writers and suggest storylines or is that... Oh, look, I probably could, you know. I probably... I've got quite a good relationship um, with Shane, one, the head writer, one of the head writers. Um, uh, but I haven't dropped that one on him. I, I really should. Um, <laughs> Send this to him. <laughs> yes. I watch Talking Prisoner. And, you know, you've got to get into it. You've got to watch it for, like, at least a couple of hours. But then I come up with something really good. <laughs> Yeah, that'd be great. Now, B, you're yeah, so, such an amazing actress. Um, going back on Neighbours, have you had a lot of the younger cast members come up to you for advice or different pointers? No? They don't want to know anything from me. They they are all doing their own stuff. It's so they're, they're, I mean, Georgie Stone, who I work with all the time and absolutely adore, you know, they don't want to know stuff from me. They're, they're doing their own things. Yeah. I mean, they probably do watch like I watched if you know what I mean but um you know someone like Zima is so funny so hilarious who plays Roxy you know she's just you can't tell her how to do comedy she's doing it you know there's so you know um I don't work with that many of the young ones though which is a shame I'd like to um but I mainly work with um Ryan and Jackie and Alan there's that's little foursome we we do a lot of stuff together and obviously the little kids like Scarlett Anderson um I I do some I teach I do some teaching stuff with her I do some drama stuff with her um because you know she's been on the show since she was six months old and she's never had a drama lesson I was like oh okay let's do something (laughs) so um so yeah so she's so yeah, yeah, I, I would imagine she's um, learning stuff from me, or I'm helping yeah. her with stuff. Um, Colette is somebody who does a lot of work with the youngsters because she actually works with them heaps, um, and and uh, she's really fantastic with that stuff. Yeah, you played uh, Doreen on Prisoner. <laughs> Hello, <laughs> national treasure that she yeah, is. Definitely. Yeah, absolutely. No, she's just. Um, she's fantastic, and she spends heaps and heaps and heaps of time on the youngsters. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. This next question, uh, and I've, I've actually, harking back to my couple of years of stint on the show um, and thinking of Craig McLaughlin kicking open the studio door and screaming out, it's party time. <laughs> Can you share any funny on-set stories with us? you know, over the last 30 odd years? Wow. Gosh. <laughs> um, oh, this, there's so many. Um, <laughs> yes. Yeah, so we did some really funny stuff um, with, with Craig and um, uh, Anthony Fletcher, who played the Reverend Richards. Um, and Ashley Paskey, who played Matt. Oh, Ashley, uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and he was really funny. Um, <laughs> he was great. We we um, we um got along incredibly well. And Beth Buchanan, who's actually been back again as yeah. well um, with Roxy's wedding coming up. So um, she's in it again. She plays Gemma Ramsey. And, um, look, there was just, there was just so, it was all crazy back then. And we were young, and we did silly things, and um, yeah, there were there were. Uh, I remember a time where I had food poisoning. 
doesn't sound so hilarious, doesn't mean to say it like that. <laughs> um, but I was really, really sick and I had to do, I had to do scenes where I was tap dancing. Oh, and, that'd be fun. And I would get up and I would do the scene, I would do the tap dancing and then I would fall on, lie on the floor with a bucket yeah. and, um, <laughs> and throw up. And then they'd say, are you ready again, Lucinda? And I'd go, <laughs> nothing would take me. And I'd stand up and I'd do it again. Tap dancing, woohoo! Oh. Tap, fall dead um, and throw up again. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so there were moments like that that were pretty hysterical. Um, oh, look, there was just, it was just continually a laugh. It was all, it was somebody, somebody doing something stupid all the time you know yeah. and yeah and it still is we still do you know we spend the majority of the time laughing yeah and and that's a really great workplace Definitely. when you can do that you know because we do we we just you know ryan and i try to make each other laugh all the time <laughs> and he finds things on the internet to show me and i you know do old pantomime routines for him <laughs> and <laughs> between the two of it it's, and with the kids as well you know we just keep it fun and light yeah. um which i think keeps you know the energy in our scenes and, and all that sort of stuff because we like to chop it around and just make it as fun as possible yeah. so we just try to think of things that are fun to do or silly to do or stupid to do or why don't we do this or you know so yeah so we're still having fun with it and i think majority of the people that work there in fact pretty much everyone that works there i think is is there because they're having fun yeah that's great and what a what an actress i mean food poisoning and doing tap dancing i mean that that's <laughs> that's great what you got to do it's yeah. what you got to do when you you know, you know it's just like you know you couldn't have days off if you know what i mean it was just like it was you could to a degree but then eventually the show's going to go out. So, you know, and I think it was at that point, I think I'd already had like, you know, three or four days off and I was still in this terrible state. So, <laughs> of course, then what happens if you've had three or four days off is that you have one scene after another scene after another scene, like you might have 12, 15 scenes in a day or something like that because yeah. you haven't been there for the rest of the, the week. So, yeah, so everything concertina is into one and then you've just got to, you know, like, okay, I'm up, I'm tap dancing, I'm asleep. Oh, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> so, um, yes. Wow. Well, what um, you got to do? What you got to do? Yeah, that's true. Now, we've covered the next few questions, Ken, before the fan questions, but I will throw in one question that um, is not on our sheet. Is yeah. there a character that you'd like to see come back from the original days of Neighbours? to come back now? I know they've brought a few back. Um, yeah, look, they have. They've brought heaps back. And and yeah. I think, you know, and Richard uh, Huggett, who plays yes. Glenn Donnelly, the, uh, the, the most recent ones, who is a total winner. That's fantastic. Yeah. I love that choice. Um, and, of course, I worked with Richard back in the day, which was great. Um, he was amazing oh. with East Street as well. Yes, he was in East yeah. Street as well. I loved East Street so yeah. much. It's such a great show. Um, and had so many great actors in it. Mm. Um, who would I like to see come back? From my era, um, you know, I really, um, I, I think I'm, I'm probably just saying this because they're one of my friends. <laughs> <laughs> But um, the guy who played the Reverend Richards is, a, is one of is my best friend in the world, Anthony Fletcher, and I met him during the show. That was where we and we became friends, and we're still friends thirty seven years later. Um, so, um, and he came back to marry me and Joe. Ah, oh, okay. Yeah, 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 which was lovely. But he was the he was the um, vicar when there was the the terrible cake competition. Yeah. And the reason why Melanie won the cake competition was because he fancied Melanie. Of course, her cake wasn't the best. <laughs> it was pig cake. How could you imagine that taste? It looked absolutely disgusting. Um, so, so, yeah. So, um, look, Ian Smith and Charleston, yeah. um, 
Vivian Gray, Myra de Groot, um, Anne Hattie, um, Fiona Cork. Um, <laughs> um, so many brilliant characters, yeah. um, so many brilliant actors. Um, and yeah, and you know, then there's all of the people that work that have been in it in the between times as well, you know, like people like Janet and, um, you know, um, Jane, um, oh God, what's her last name? Oh, that's terrible. All these names oh, are coming out of my head. Jane Hall, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Jane Hall, absolutely brilliant. And absolutely brilliant in Wentworth. Hello. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Who knew she had that in her? I know, that was amazing. And she played one of Paul's wives as well, I think. Yes, Jane. yes, she was another one of the harem, yes. <laughs> Um, yeah, so she was great as well. I don't know whether any of these people died. You see, that's the problem. If you die, then, I'll, well, unless you're Harold, because then you can come back, because it was all just <laughs> terrible. Terminably. <laughs> oh, that show could so do with Smithy, if you know what I mean. He's just, he yeah. was just, speaking of people who kept things light on set and kept everyone he had a talent with that stuff. He just kept everybody giggling and he was just amazing. So, you know, I think he's probably, I'd say he's my favourite Neighbours character, was Harold Bishop. Yeah, he was great. So any chance that we can revive him for his third um, <laughs> return from the dead? <laughs> You know what? I don't think any fan would care how they brought Harold back. They would just love that he's back, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It would just be it would just be the best. Yeah. You know. Um, even if he came back as a ghost. <laughs> what? Maybe after people have been taking Melanie's um marijuana tincture yeah. um they could start seeing harold walking around the streets of the ramsey street you know around the houses in someone in the garage i was just, I was just getting the vacuum out of the garage I'm sure i saw harold <laughs> <laughs> do you realize you've just created the next year's worth of storylines for neighbors just here harold and <laughs> But I mean, how great was Harold and uh, Tom Oliver, Lou Carpenter, when they? Oh, I know, absolutely. You know, like, like, badge. I mean, they were great together. <laughs> so fantastic together, absolutely. Yeah. And what a, you know, what a threesome! Just absolutely brilliant. <laughs> yeah, hilarious. Yeah. yeah. So you know, any of those ones would be great. Yeah, would <laughs> make it so. <laughs> yeah. It's so. We'll try. Uh, it's time to, time to get to fan questions. And, yes. and this, this one is from Janice Robertson, our own Janice Robertson that from is. the Scottish Highlands. Uh, she has two questions. Did you enjoy your time in the UK and would you come back? And the second question is, is there any other shows that you would like to be in? Do you want a list? Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, did I enjoy? I loved living in the UK. I absolutely loved it. I loved the variety of work. That was the thing I think that really excited me about living in England and working in the theatre, which um, I just always wanted to do and um, just couldn't get enough of here um, because there just isn't enough here. Um, because there isn't enough made, there isn't enough gone to. You know, we don't have the tradition, the, the same traditions of, of um, going to theatre. And also we have so much better weather, which um, stops us from doing things indoors, I suppose. Um, so, yeah, so I absolutely adored, um, you know, being able to work. I, I, did, I did play in Paris. I did, you know, workshops in Greece and, um, you know, I all sorts of stuff. So I just love that proximity of being able to go everywhere. I loved the um, the way the arts is treated in Europe is just so much better than here. So, you know, those sorts of things are acknowledged more. I think they're, um, they're, they're elevated in their importance um, in Europe as opposed to here where we're just completely sport obsessed. And so 
sport and art normally always get the same political folio and all the money seems to go to sport in Australia and very little to the arts. So I just love that kind of um, a more, um, more artistic kind of society um, that I had the opportunity to be involved with over there. So, yeah, I really loved that. I loved the amount of different kinds of work I could do. I felt like I wasn't stuck in one thing. I could go and be a possum one day and I could go and be a stand-up comedian the next. And, you know, so it was, it was, um, it was, I really loved it. And, you know, I probably would have stayed there if I didn't all of a sudden have the revelation that I, I'd been a dreadful daughter. <laughs> um, so, so, um, so yeah, so I, I yeah, I, I thought it was great. And yes, I would love to come back. I would love yeah. to come back at some point. I would love to bring my partner over to the UK and I'd also love to bring my stepdaughter over to the UK and introduce them to all my friends that I miss so very, very, very much. Um, and hopefully one day we'll all be able to fly around again like we mm. used to and you can go and do some episodes of something in the UK and then come back and do, you know, wouldn't that be nice? So, yeah, let's talk about things I'd like to do. <laughs> Shows. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, oh, um, I'd just love to do that, get into that sort of streaming service drama stuff or comedy. Um, sex education, I would so love to be a teacher in sex education if anyone's out there watching and interested. <laughs> it's one of my favourite shows. Um, I think you could do with an Australian teacher in it. Australian teachers are everywhere in England. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, yeah, look, you know, um, I'd love to do more theatre. Um, I loved the theatre that I did in the UK, so I'd love to come over and do more theatre as well. And maybe even some comedy or maybe even a festival like Edinburgh or, um, you know, there's a great festival, comedy festival in Manchester these days. There's a really good one in Ireland. Um, and, you know, some of that sort of stuff. So, yes, I would love to. Um, hopefully, fingers crossed, when the world Reopen. does go back to normal one day. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that sort of stuff might be around. Fingers crossed. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, Marilyn McPhee from the UK also. Do you remember any of the crew like Ken? And is there any crew still there that you worked with from before? Uh, mm -hmm. Back mm -hmm. in the early days. Well, I'm really sorry, but I, I don't really remember. Sorry, Ken. Don't tell him. He'll get upset. <laughs> <laughs> I should have just said that I did. I'm sorry. That was, I just should have acted, it, shouldn't I? I should have said, yeah, yeah, I remember Ken. Yeah. <laughs> Ken and me go way back. <laughs> <clears throat> um, and I said, yes, there is a cameraman that was there back in the day that I have had a quick word with Ken about, a guy called Andy, who um, I think is probably leaving soon um uh it's a lovely beautiful woman called mandy Sedaway who worked in wardrobe then i don't know whether you remember mandy ken she's just done 30 years wow. um working on neighbors um on and off of course not 30 years consecutively but it's been 30 years from when she started working there to to now um so yeah there's a lot of people that have been there for a really long time and there's people that were there that worked on prisoner um mm beforehand so yeah but you know not so many now because you know we're all getting old, all getting old. Oh, you're not old <laughs> young at heart yeah you still look young mark stubbs says uh hi lucinda love your return to neighbors as melanie i'd like to ask what difference you've noticed working in tv now compared to the 1980s Thanks, Mark. Um, glad you're enjoying the show. Um, look, yeah, well, I was quickly talking with Ken earlier and yes, the cameras are all little now. So we used to have these huge cameras which were like huge Daleks. That's what I used to think of them as, that would sort of move towards you very slowly. Um, but they were really heavy, super heavy. And, you know, the cameraman really had to oh, push them around to get them to move smoothly and stuff like that. And now they're very light, high tech. Um, we use a camera called a Ronin, 
um, a lot, which is a camera that does uh, 360 degrees, oh, yeah. um, kind of like a handheld camera now, um, but we use that a lot. Um, there's been some changes in some sets lately where we've had four walls and we've been using the Ronin in there. And that'll be really interesting to look at when those episodes start to come on air. Um, and um, we've also been using a drone. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. For some outside stuff that we're doing, some location stuff, we've been using drones. So that's quite a big change. Um, and there's a lot of waiting around because the drones go off the line. <laughs> um, so, you know, like all technology, not always incredibly reliable. Um, yeah. When you are on location, can be little difficult but you know that's just the beginning of something and when you start at the beginning of something there's always teething problems hey so yeah yeah so um so yeah so yeah there's been lots and lots of changes like that i think there's also changes in the fact that the show is much more raunchy than it was when i was in it in the 80s you know it so wasn't raunchy i remember being told that you know scenes that we did that i seen that mark and i had done together was two nine o'clock you know if you know what i mean there was sort of like you know that was like you know a nine o'clock scene not a six o'clock scene it's like oh okay i didn't realize it was time specific yes. um <laughs> but yeah so you know it's much saucier than it was um when i worked on it there there would never have been the people having sex in the workplace and stuff like the scenes that I had to do earlier last year <laughs> so um yeah there was that that wasn't it's definitely raunchier um and there's a lot of technical changes because of technology yeah definitely well um Max who's a huge fan of Prisoner and Neighbours also brought up your first episode he absolutely loved Neighbours when he was a teen and it was you that was so popular over in the UK at the time and he thinks one of your funniest scenes was your first episodes. But he also asked, was it your decision to leave at that time when you left Neighbours? Yes. Yes, it was. Yes. I, um, it was, it was, I just wasn't sure. Mark had decided to leave um, and that was um, unchanged, if you know what I mean. I think he had things organised in the UK that he was going to do. And so that was like a, he was definitely leaving. Um, so it was about whether... I wanted, they were going to kill him or, you know, something like that. And I was like, I don't think I want, you know, sad, desperate, bereft Melanie, <laughs> you know, for a year of, you know, I was like, yeah. And so I thought, you know, maybe it's time for me to go too. So, and I was of course interested in all of the things that were being offered in the UK as well. So I think that sort of, I just thought it was kind of, easier for us to go off together um but and also you know it's an interesting this this question has come up a number of times with you know why did you leave when you did because melanie was just you know right at her peak you know of and and i think actually that's the time to leave because you want to leave with people missing you rather than people being sick of you <laughs> uh, <laughs> and you know when you play a character that is quite as, um, you know, you either love her or hate her, pretty much, and she gets a fair bit of hate on the internet, that's for sure. Who's Melanie? Really? Yeah. How could you hate Melanie? Uh, well, because she's a bit annoying. Wow. wow. Yeah. So, there's a, yeah, there are these people out there that hate Melanie. So it's like... Do you, do you read some of that? Like, do you go online yeah. and... And how do you yeah. feel about that? How do you feel when you, you, you read things like that? Well, um, oh, you're disappointed. You don't go, yay, people think I'm uh, yeah. <laughs> really annoying and horrible. <laughs> but everybody has opinions. Everybody, you can't please everybody ever. And, and if you're playing a character that's full on, you're always going to polarise, you know. So I, I think that means I'm doing my job. She's such an adorable character. Well, I think she's adorable too, <laughs> <laughs> but she's also, she's polarizing. 
the laugh is a big thing. It's annoying. And, and people who didn't know her from the first time round when she's come back are like, who the hell is this annoying, you know, old woman trying to rush Toady off his feet? If you know what I mean? <laughs> so <laughs> they're like, we want Sonia. <laughs> and I understand because Eve. Yeah. What a divine actress, you know. Yeah. And what an incredible person. And she still works at Neighbours, just so everybody knows. Oh, she She's does. actually the um, drama coach at Neighbours. Oh, wow. And the cast liaison. Oh, she's got about 15 different titles. She's fabulous. They couldn't let her go. Um, so, yeah, so Eve's still there. So, um, in fact, we had, she was our, <laughs> she, you know how you have intimacy coordinators now? Oh, this you thing. We have intimacy co coordinators. So when you have to do a scene, that involves anything um, romantic or sexual or whatever, um, you have to have an intima intimacy coordinator on set. Now, our intimacy coordinator on set was Eve. Okay. Me and Ryan and Eve. <laughs> what a messy triangle that is. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not, it's not the stunt coordinators helping out with you. It's... Yeah. <laughs> Well, like there's stunt coordinators as well, of course, but yeah. Eve isn't one of those. <laughs> um, yeah, so I know how how weird was that? That was just so yeah. weird for me. I was like, oh, so your ex-wife is your dead wife, not just your ex-wife, but your your dead wife is going to take us through the, the tricky sex scenes? Hmm. <laughs> Great. Hmm. Um, okay. <laughs> So, yeah, so, no, it was, she was, of course, absolutely brilliant and just does her mm. job and none of it's got anything to do with it. And she, she loves Toadie and Melanie together. She adores them. So, and, and who wouldn't? <laughs> so, yeah, no, it's, it's um, yeah, you do. You get both. And I think she is, there is a polarising aspect of her, definitely, I think. And, and I think probably for youngsters who haven't come across her before, they're like, who the hell, what the hell? yeah you know so but i think you know for other people that have been watching it forever um it's nice for for the older characters to come back yeah oh definitely i think it's great mm -hmm. problem is you know online yeah everyone has an opinion behind a keyboard i mean that's well, even ken and i are learning that as we go i mean we, we cop some yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're doing and yeah yeah well you know that's the thing and you have to realize that if you took everyone's opinion into account then you would go completely crazy so the people's opinions that actually count are, you know, your producers and your other performers and the people that you work with and your peers and stuff. And if some of my one of my peers said that they thought I was crap or, you know, that would that would pain yeah. my heart, um, you know, terribly. But somebody who doesn't know me or doesn't know what I do and doesn't understand the process and all of those things, that's just that's just an opinion and it's and yeah. it's subjective like anything, like a joke, if you know what I mean. You say a joke, some people think it's funny, some people don't think it's funny. One night I say a joke on stage, brings the house down. Next night, same joke, nothing. Yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> if you know what I mean? So that's what you kind of think of as your internet, you know, Trolls. keyboard warriors. Yeah. Um, is like, it's the same thing. Tomorrow, if they saw that, they might like me. Yeah. But today they don't. Yeah. And that's okay. Yeah. No, definitely. I agree. Yeah, you got to you get pretty tough skinned, I reckon, doing this job. Everybody, everybody has an opinion about you. So, and 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 they're all valid. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Here's Cole Taylor's comment. I liked her as Mandy in Prisoner, telling Anne it would be great if she could have a word with her boss, as they would listen because she's so old. <laughs> she should have been in it more, says Cole. Which is yeah. a comment shared by a lot more Prisoner fans as well. Yeah. They missed a trick there, didn't they? Yeah. yeah. Fun with Mandy. She could have had a whole, whole spin-off series. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> um, Brian Lee Whitworth also said, my question is that they have seemed to have toned down the iconic laugh in the more recent episodes. Was that intentional? Um, no, I think it was just to do with 
sort of a bit of, you know, reality in the fact that it, she was going through things that weren't that much fun yeah. and wasn't laughing so much. So hopefully when things are more back to normal for her and she's she's not quite as run ragged as she was last year, um, you know, because there was a big storyline with um, the beautiful Lucy Durack who came in and played Rose oh, who yeah. was going to steal Toadie off me. Um, so there was a lot of, um, you know, sort of not as much just being fun, Melanie, I suppose, yeah. in, that, in, those, in those times. But I, I often kind of go, hang on a minute, there hasn't been a laugh for a while. <laughs> Don't we need to get some laughs in? Um, so, yeah. Yeah, so yes, there will be there will be more, you know, when it when in when it's apropos. <laughs> <laughs> Robert Ivory wants to ask you about Body Melt. What are your memories of that gruesome film? <laughs> um, I remember auditioning for it, um, which I think I might have auditioned for a different part that I got, which happens, you know, sometimes. Um and yeah, I remember it being um, just you know really difficult to do that sort of horror kind of acting, <laughs> and and I just felt like it was really camp, if you know what I mean. I just remember just thinking, oh, this is so camp, yeah. Um, and yeah, and exploding and stuff, and yeah, and then and then I got a part where I didn't explode, so I was really pleased that I didn't have to explode because everybody that was working with it had like hours and days in makeup and things like that where they were exploding all over the place and their bodies were melting <laughs> um and you know as someone who can't stomach violence i've actually never watched the whole movie i've oh, only yeah. watched my scene <laughs> sorry <laughs> the not exploding scenes <laughs> it was exploding in my scenes i just wasn't exploding it just wasn't me but somebody <laughs> else exploded <laughs> oh. it was messy that's that's my memory of it messy long and um and you know i was just very grateful that i stayed in one piece yeah. <laughs> it's good to see you in one piece <laughs> yes. um pete clark said hi lucinda my question is here in the uk in the late 80s elaine smith and peter o'brien were appearing in pantomimes much to the delight of all giddy screaming teenage neighbor neighbors fans when you worked on Neighbours, did you ever hear them discussing what it was like to be working in the pantomimes? Everybody was. Everyone, <clears throat> Everybody yeah. was discussing that um, because it was a new thing. Yeah. Um, it hadn't really happened to a show in Australia that the actors all went over to, yeah. the, to another country and did all these other things. Um, so it was really exciting. And you'd hear that oh, someone's just been offered blah, 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 panto. And so and so has been offered, you know, 10,000 pounds a week doing blah, 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 blah. Yeah. You know, it was all, all this sort of stuff. And it was like, oh, who's, oh, 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 oh. no, I wonder if I'm going to be offered something like that one day. Oh. <laughs> so yeah, it was really exciting time because people were just coming back from, from the UK at that time. <coughs> Like Steph, you know, you know, and yeah. and he was being chased, like the Beatles, if you know yeah. what I mean, um, by youngsters, by the youth of the the mother country, yeah. <laughs> and um, and yeah, so that was pretty. Um, that was that sounded pretty exciting, for you know, some young girl from Mentone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that sounded really exciting. And how do I get onto that? Is, yeah. was, so I think because of that, I think that's part of why people left quickly. If you uh -huh. know what I mean, I think that was part of why people were like, oh, should we stay a bit? Or should we go over to the UK and see what happens? Because exciting things are happening for people over there. Yeah. Um, and I think that was, part, that was definitely part of it. Um, that there was there were these amazing options in this, you know, in this big European country, um, you know, and and people were doing amazing things, and you know, Kylie was you know number yeah. one, and and yeah. you know she was you know it was it was amazing what was happening to people, so you know I kind of think everybody was like yeah get me some of that. 
Definitely. Um, just before I, I mentioned Jason Burridge's comment, um, it, I'm so pleased that Matt and I actually are interviewing you and not uh, a leg or an arm or something like that, you know, <laughs> apropos of body melt. Um, Jason Burridge actually says, love her. Oh, and I, mean, I think he means all of you. Yes, of not you. just an arm or a leg. <laughs> <laughs> But that's a comment shared by many other fans. I mean, we could list 30 more comments saying how much they adore you, Melanie. Oh. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of love there. So, Thank yeah. you. Thank you so much for the love. We feel the, the love and it's the really fantastic. Yeah, yeah, and it's, no, it's great because, you know, when a show's been going for so long and, you know, and you have ups and peaks and troughs in your career and stuff, it's really fantastic that people yeah. still remember people so fondly and and um you know that you've made some kind of an impression which there is, is one more question um from yes. sally in the uk what is it like working with the sexy dr carl who's had his fair share of affairs as well <laughs> Sorry, i should never have laughed at the fact that that she finds dr carl sexy there was a lot well there's a lot of women <laughs> i know i know i <laughs> you know um look why would you ever try anything else if you were with Jackie Woodburn? I mean, really? Really? <laughs> I mean, yeah, well, speaking of people in prison, she was so sensational when she was in prison. Yeah. My goodness. Yeah. Um, I, look, I managed to cope um, working with Alan Fletcher. I managed to keep, to not for him and, and you know, <laughs> come to me. I managed to not um, attack him or be inappropriate with him in a workplace situation. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, he is so funny, Alan. He's great fun to work with. I love working with him and Jack. It's just so yeah. much fun. They're, they're like a, a couple that have been together for 50 years, those two. Um, they have their own language virtually. It's... Um, they're just incredible together. They 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 finish each other's sentences. They know each other so well. Um, they know the show so well. They know the way everything works so well. It's 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 great to work with them. And Alan is seriously, fantastically funny. You know, he has a pun for everything. Um, and he's really he's really old school, and it really makes me laugh. Um, so yeah, so I do manage to keep myself in check. Yep. <laughs> um, and I and I don't feel the desire. You know, I try to work on on my desire to quell it enough to get through the scene, so I I don't just all of a sudden stick my tongue in his ear. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's fantastic! I don't think he'd really like anyway. So <laughs> he's a very happily married man. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that was. Uh, I'm glad that Dr. Carl's got a lot of love out there. He 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 should have a lot of love out there. He does, sure does. Is there anything else you'd like to add before we wrap up, Kim? No, I'd just like to say thanks for having me. I'd like to say thank you to all the people who sent in questions. They were all great. Um, thanks for watching. Thanks for remembering. <laughs> thanks for being here. <laughs> No, uh, th thank you for coming. It's been an absolute honour to have you on and learn about your life and your career. And you know, being a fan myself of you in Neighbours back in the back in the day, you've been very gracious with your time, and you've been so much fun. It's absolute an absolute pleasure, Matt. I've had a really lovely time. Really enjoyed myself. Thank you. Thank you. Lovely having you. That was episode two of Talking Prisoner Presents. Thank you for watching. If you could please subscribe to our YouTube channel and like it and share the videos all around the internet. And also please like our Facebook, Twitter and Instagram page, all the social media. And this episode of Talking Prisoner Presents will also be available across all the podcast platforms, including Apple, Google, Spotify, iHeartRadio and the rest of them. And also on the talkingprisoner.com website. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.